Okay, let's pray and we will start. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another new day in our lives. And as we spend time in your word, we ask that you'll open our hearts, open our minds. Uh, we pray, God, that by your spirit, you will minister to each of us. Do a powerful work in us, even as we hear your word and as we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit. Do a powerful work in us. And let Jesus be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So I hope all of you uh, took some time to review um, the notes, like whatever we've covered. All right. So whatever we do today, tomorrow, in the evenings, please go over the notes. Okay. So uh, don't say, okay, I attended class. Kam ho gaya. No. <laughs> Work is not over. You have to go to the notes, go through all the scriptures in, in the Bible. Right? So that you should do in the evenings after you know after five o'clock. You have your time. I'll go back and review the lessons, read the scriptures, study it. All right. So don't just say it. attending class is one part, but you need to study. Right? Study that. So I hope all of you have um, are doing that. You take some extra time every day. Uh, to review whatever you have learnt. So we've covered up till section 2. Uh, who can tell me 2 Corinthians 5.17? Without opening your Bible. Who can say it? 2 Corinthians 5.17? Okay, who's saying that? Uh, when I say it. Yeah, use the mic, please. Yeah. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Finish, finish. All things are passed away. Good, good. You've come seventy five percent, and all things have become new. Right. So uh, I want all of you to memorize scripture. All right. If you don't memorize scripture. I will have to fail all of you. <laughs> You'll have to repeat the class. Second Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Who can tell me Ephesians 1 verse 3? Take the mic, please. Uh, online students, you're also welcome to participate. Uh, I want all of you to memorize these scriptures. So let's see. Ephesians 1 3. Is your mic on? Is it? Blessed be the God and Father. Very good. So blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Right? So in Christ, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. All right. Who can tell me? First Corinthians 1 verse 30. Don't open your Bibles. You have to tell me without saying. First Corinthians 1 verse 30. God. First Corinthians 1 verse 30. 3 zero. God, anyone? God has brought us into union with God, if you want to do the New King James. But of Him, because of Him, we are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. That means God has brought us into union with Jesus. And God has made Christ to be unto us wisdom. So tomorrow I'm going to ask you these three verses. Okay? I'll ask anyone. You have to answer. These three verses. Ephesians 1, 3. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. So tomorrow we have... Oh, sorry. We don't have class. No, only next week. Okay. All right. Next week. 
any of these three verses, okay? Anyone in class, you have to memorize, you have to memorize it. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Ephesians 1, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. We're going to look at some more verses, so I'm going to add to this list. And next week, I will call anyone, and you have to answer. Okay, no excuse. Today, you've got grace. <laughs> next week, you have to answer. You have to know the scriptures. Okay? So turn with me, please, to Colossians 3, verse 15. Colossians 3, verse 15. So, you know, why must we memorize scripture? Why must I know the scriptures? Well, I'll give you some reasons. You know, the online students, uh, I know I won't be able to catch you online, but um, I, want, I want to encourage all of you to also memorize scripture. Okay? I'll put that effort in to memorize scripture. Now, why must we memorize scripture? I'll give you a few reasons. Colossians. Before we start our main lesson, I'm just, this is a, a, a side lesson right now to encourage us to memorize scripture. Is the voice okay now? Um, I see somebody saying that you can't hear my voice, so it's okay. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3 verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? Not a little bit. But let the word of Christ be where? Be in you. Hmm? Not just in your Bible. Not just in your notes. Not just on your phone. So I got full Bible up on the phone. It's okay. It has to be in you. Right? Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Richly. So in all wisdom and understanding. You know, so then you can teach, you can admonish one another. You can even sing. It's just in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So from that, from that deposit in your heart, you can teach. You can encourage. You can sing. You can come up with spiritual songs. All this. But first the word of Christ must dwell in you. Which, right? See another reason why the word of God must dwell in us. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. And um, verse, thir verse 13 and 14. First John 2, 13 and 14. All right, online students, I hope you're all following. Yes, I'm just giving you a few reasons why you must memorize scripture, why the word of God has to dwell in you richly, right? So we saw Colossians 3.16. Now we're going to look at 1 John 2, chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. John writes, he says, I have written to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. I have written to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. Now notice very carefully. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. See, if you want to live an overcoming life, if you want to overcome the wicked one, if you want to live a victorious life, Christian life, the word of God must abide in you. If you want to be strong so that you can live an overcoming life, the word of God must be in you. So I got I got new Bible. Very good. But this Bible must be in you. Only then you will be strong. Only then you can overcome the wicked. So you must make the effort to put the word of God into you. It should be in your heart and in your mind. It should be there. And then you can speak it. You can be strong. You can overcome the wicked. One. Right? I'll give you one more reason. John 15 verse 7. John 15 verse 7. What did Jesus say here? 
Another reason why, you know, you need to put the word of God into your heart. Know it, like they say, by heart, you know. Know it with your heart. It should be in you. John 15, verse 7. Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Right? You must be in me. My words must be in you. Then he said, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. See, if his words are in you, so ask what you want. It will be done for you. See, what a blessing. You can have your prayers answered. But he said first, you have to abide in me. My words must be in you. You understand? So, make the effort. Make the effort. So, the, another reason why we have to memorize scripture. Because uh, his word can abide in us. And he said, our prayers will be answered. You can ask what you want. And it will be done for you. So, when his words are in you, you don't have to be afraid of asking anything wrong. That's why he said you can ask whatever you want. Because when his word is in you, you will not ask for anything against him, against his words. Right? That's why he's giving like a blank check. You ask what you want. But first condition, you abide in me, my words must be in you. Then whatever you ask, it'll always be in line with the word of God. You ask what you want, it'll be done. Okay? So I'm going to push you. To memorize scripture, okay? So three verses for next week. I'll give you some or three more before we finish today. So six verses next week. I'll catch anyone you have to answer. Challenge, okay? Take it like a challenge. Because it's good for you, good for good for all of us. Even I have to memorize scripture. All right, let's get into the lesson today. Okay, and online students, I cannot catch any of you. <laughs> but please... Memorize these scriptures along with the uh, students who are here. Uh, you also do your part. I may not be able to question you, but I trust you will do it. Nice. Okay. Let us uh, move forward from where we stopped last week. Sorry, this is action. So we're now going to go into, uh, this is section 3. We stopped at the end of section 2. So let's go, please, to section 3, which is lesson number 22, page 33. Page 33, lesson number 22. Today, so from now on, we're going to look at specifics, specifics, specific aspects of our life in Christ. Right. So till now, first two sections, we were establishing the fact that God has brought us into union with Christ and what that means, that we are new creation in Christ, new people, new in the spirit. Right. So. From now on, we're going to look at different aspects of this, right? different aspects. The first aspect of who we are in Christ is that in Christ, we are justified. Or we That's sorry. Where did we stop? Um, we stopped. At 16. Oh, we stopped at 16. Okay, thank you. So, sorry? Uh, we stopped at 18. Uh, the new creation. Oh, yes, now I remember. I remember. Uh, we, we stopped early last week. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So we stopped at 18. Okay, let's start from there. So please go with me to page number 29, lesson number 18, 
Okay, let me explain this. So, Ephesians 4, verse 24. Paul says, put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Put on the new man. So in your spirit, so in your spirit, you have become a new man. You are a new creation. No question. God has made you a new creation in your spirit. Now he's saying, put on the new man. That means this new person that you've become in your spirit must be seen outside. People must see that you're a new person. right? And so we mentioned last time, uh, we need to renew our minds. We need to crucify the flesh. We will talk about it later on. It will come in, the, in a future lesson. How we, what change we need to have in our mind and in our body so that this new man can be seen. Put on the new man. But in Ephesians 4.24, I want to focus in now on the fact that this new man is created according to God. Or, to put it in simple English, it is created in the image of God. So your new man, this new creation that you have become in your spirit, is in God's image. It's in the likeness, the resemblance of God. It has the virtues of God, that is righteousness and holiness. It has the nature of God. It has the life of God. So this new man, new creation in your spirit, it has the nature of God. God is holy, your new man is holy. God is righteous, your new man is righteous. God is love, your new man is love. What are the attributes of God, you know, you talk about the virtues of God. That is who this new man is, the new man inside you is created in the image of God. That's what it means. And we are created in the image of God so that we can resemble God. We can represent God. Okay? It doesn't make us God. I'm not saying we are God. No. God is God. We are human beings. But what He's done is, in our new man, He's made this new creation in His image. Put His qualities, His virtues, His nature, His life, He's put it inside this new man. So now we have the capacity to walk in God-like qualities. Or in English we say, godliness. We can walk in godliness or holiness. We have the capacity. Why? Because the new man inside you is created in the image of You understand? So, we should never say, I cannot be holy. I cannot live holy. I cannot love. I cannot be kind. We should never say that. Why? Because God has put those, if you want to use the word, the, those qualities, those virtues, those capacities. He's put it into your spirit, in your new, in, in new man. Of course, in the body, we may feel upset in the flesh, in our emotions, we may feel upset, we may feel angry, somebody says something, we'll feel hurt. All those feelings we'll have. But the new man has the love of God. The new man has holiness. The new man has the capacity to walk in holiness, to walk in love, kindness, and so on. You understand? So we have to live out of that new man. And this new man is created in the image of Okay. So we can walk in it. Look at some additional scriptures. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. This is on page 30. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given you everything to live godly by His power. 
He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Just by the fact that we know him, we know Jesus. He called us to glory. He also called us to virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. See, you and I, we are partakers of the divine nature. It says right there, that means His divine nature is in you. We are partakers of the nature of God. His life and nature is in us. And because of that, we can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Corruption that is in the world means the moral decline, the moral decay. Uh, we escape that. We are not trapped in it. So, but the world around me is so evil. The world around is so bad. Uh, there's all kind of evil influence. But the Bible says, you are a partaker of divine nature. So you escape the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. Are you understand? We, we are not bound by it. Yes, it is around us. We are in this world. There is corruption all around us. Corruption means moral decline, moral decay. Because of lust, evil desire, people are doing all those things. But the Bible says, you are a partaker of the divine nature. And because of that, you escape the corruption that is in the world. And live free from it. You're not trapped by it. You're not under its influence. Because God has given to us everything that we need for life and godliness. Amen? So, this is the, what God has done for us in the new man. Right? That does not mean we will never face temptation. No. You'll face temptation. But you have what God, what God has given you. His, you have the divine nature in you. So you can escape it. You can overcome it. 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Born of God. That means it's like God gave birth to you. Now if God gives birth, has given birth to you, whose life do you have? Whose nature do you have? Does a cat give birth to a dog? No. Right? So if God gave birth to you, you have the life and the nature of God. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Savior, Messiah, is born of God. You are born of God. God's life and nature is in you. It's like God has given birth to you. Where? In your spirit. So you have the life and the nature of God in your spirit. Are you understanding? But this is so important. Question. Uh, let's pass the mic, please. Oh, yeah. In the beginning when Adam was created, it's written that uh, God breathed his spirit. Yes. And we were made in the image of God. Yes. So that time spirit was actually the uh, part that was image of God. Yes, like God's life and nature. Yes. Mm. But now also the same thing is happening where by accepting Christ, yes. we are in the image of God. That's the inner man is in the image of God. Yes. So what is the difference? So the difference is this. So Adam, like you're saying, God breathed into Adam. That is, when God breathes, it means like something of him is being imparted. So Adam had the life and the nature of God. Uh, that's why Luke chapter 3, verse 38, it says, Adam was the son of God. Luke 3, 38. That means he's, God gave him life, life. He was born of God. But what happened? When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost it. They lost the life and nature of God. And death came into this world. Sin and death. And we were cut off from the life of God. So I'll give you two verses to explain what I'm saying. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Ephesians 4 
Um, or let's just read, uh, and so reading the full passage. Yeah, verse 18, we can just, um, okay, let's read verse 17 and 18. It gives us the context. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. What is Paul saying? This I say therefore and testify in the law that you no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk and the futility of their mind, verse 18, having their understanding darkened, now look at this, being alienated from the life of God. Oh, that means being cut off from the life of God. So that is our spiritual condition before receiving Jesus. Adam sinned. Ever since that time, what has happened to man? We are alienated. We are cut off from the life of God. No life. So we have the human spirit, but the human spirit does not have the life of God until we are born again. So when we are born again, we are born of God. We have the life and we receive the life and the nature of God. You understand? And another verse, Romans 5.12, which we already saw, it says, For by one, one man, Romans 5, verse 12, By one man sin came into this world, and death by sin, and death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans 5 and verse 12. Romans 5 verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and death spread to all men. So every person has death in the spirit, that without the life of God. So what is death? means no life. The absence of the life of God. We are alienated from the life of God. Now when we are born again, we receive Christ. We receive life, the life of God. The life and the nature of God. Yeah. Once we receive it, it, it never cut off. It never cut off unless After. you don't want it. We want it. So when we go to heaven. Yes. So it is said that when the sin came first, it was in the heaven, like Satan. Lucifer said, yes. So when we get glorified body, so yes. we'll never sin. I'll never sin. Even in heaven, there's no sin. After there's that. no sin. There's no sin in heaven. It's a glorious place. It's the very presence of God. So when we, after we die and resurrect, when we go there, I mean, when we die and go there, our spirit, there's no sin. Our spirit and soul is pure in the presence of God. And one day we will receive glorified bodies. Right? No sin. Lesson number 19. Let's finish this. Lesson number 19. The other thing that we need to look at is that all the things have passed away. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. So all things have passed away. All things from your spirit. Okay? So there are things that remain in the mind, in the soul realm, and things that remain in the body. So example, like we said last time, if I was five, if a person was, you know, five feet, ten inches, when he is born again, he's still five feet, ten inches. Like the height, physical thing is still there. But all things, meaning things that are attached to the spirit, those things are passed away. All things become new. Same thing about the soul, which is the mind, the will, the emotions. If the person was in 10th standard, when he's born again, yeah, he's still 10th standard, 10th uh, grade level. Right? So it's not the change in the body or in the soul. It is in the spirit. All things are passed away. So things in the spirit, things like, and we will see sin, things that affect the human spirit, all those old things are removed. And instead in the human spirit, God makes us a new man. He gives us his life and nature. Our spiritual identity changes. We were darkness, now we become light. We were far away from God, now we are brought near God. 
we were strangers from the family of God. Now we are sons and daughters of God. Right? So in the spirit, everything has changed. All old things have passed away. Now, and the spiritual realm, the spirit, that's the main area of problems. That's where the devil uses, you know, he uses to hold on to people, say, so you're mine. But that has changed. You've been taken out of darkness into light. We've been taken out from the power of Satan and we've brought into the kingdom of God's dear son. So we should know that because the devil will try to use our ignorance. He'll use our ignorance to try to control us, to tell us lies. Oh, you have to be like this for the rest of your life. You cannot be free from sin. You will be under fear, all this, this, this. But those are lies. You say, no, all old things have gone. Everything has become new. I am a new creation. I'm in God's kingdom. Right? So I'm emphasizing all things are passed away, but this has to do with the spirit, the spiritual realm, things that are in the spiritual realm. Those things have been changed. All old things have passed away. All things. Verse 20, uh, lesson number 20. Lesson number 20. All things are new and from God. So Paul writes, and we're just continuing them, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God. So let's all say that together. Now, all things are from God. Let's say it again. Now, all things are from God. You know, so that, that initial part of verse 18 is important. I remember when Paul was writing his letters, he didn't write in chapter and verse. And it is one full essay. It's like a full prose or writing. So sometimes when these verses are separated, we think, oh, it's a different thought. It's not a different thought. He's continuing. So he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. New creation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. Now... All things are from God. That means everything you have in your spirit now, all things are from God. All things that are not from God have been taken out. And all things from God have been placed in your spirit. All things. Now, it's not in the future. Now, all things are from God. So everything you, you and I have in our spirit, it comes from God. Lesson 21. But what has to happen is our spirit has to grow. Our human spirit has to grow. So God has done everything. So I want you to imagine this. When a baby is born, so imagine, imagine, all right? This is a nice, healthy baby. The baby has everything that is needed to make it a full-grown human being. It has. It can grow. There's no lack. No lack. But in order for it to become a full-grown human being, it has to grow. Go through the process of growth. You understand? So, as an example, as an illustration, when you and I are born again, it's like we are like that baby in our spirit. Everything we need is there in the spirit, in our spirit. We have the life and the nature of God, but our spirit has to grow up into the full measure of Jesus Christ. You understand? The spirit has to grow. In what areas? You need to grow in knowledge. In knowing who we are. We need to grow in our spiritual strength, in our spiritual capacity. Right? That has to grow. That has to increase. But 
everything we need to become a fully grown person, God has given. It's, it's there in your spirit. That's why when you look at that, Ephesians 4, 13, it says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we all, all of us, each one of us, all of us, every one of us, we have to grow. To what? What is that? What does a fully grown Christian look like? What does a fully grown believer look like? It says, a perfect man. A perfect man means a fully grown person. We all have to grow to become fully grown. But what does it look like? It's the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means to be fully grown means you grow up to the full measure of becoming like Christ. Christ likeness. That is what we have to fully grow into. So not like, you know, not like some other man or some other woman. That's not our standard. Our standard is Christ. They have to be fully grown to become like. Are you understand? So the spirit man is like that baby. God has given everything. You know, everything is there. The life and the nature of God. You are in the image of God uh, in your spirit, and everything you need is there. But now that has to grow till we all, each one of us, we all come to the full measure and to a perfect man, a fully grown man, to the full measure. What is that? The full measure of Jesus Christ Himself to be like Jesus. So spiritually, that's our goal. To be fully grown and become like Jesus. You understanding? Yes or no? All right, so that is for our journey. Each one of us are making that journey to grow to the full measure of the stature of Christ. And how does that happen? 2 Peter 3, 18. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Page 32. But grow. So Peter is saying, grow. Keep growing. Don't stop. Keep growing. In what? In grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So grow in grace. Grace in the New Testament has different meanings. In this case, it's talking about grace or in the character in the virtues. Grow in grace. So, just make a side note. Okay, make a note in your notes. Grace in the New Testament can mean one of three things. Grace means divine character or virtue. Grace also means divine favor, unmerited favor. Grace also means divine empowerment or empowering or strength. So grace, the word grace, can mean one of three things. It can mean character. So example, John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as all of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there that grace is talking about the character of God seen in Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. John 1.14. Right, so grace. So sometimes when the word grace is used in the New Testament, it's referring to divine character. Second, grace is also used to talk about divine favor. Yeah. Example. Ephesians 2, verse 8. By grace you are saved through faith, and not by your own selves. So by grace you are saved. Here, grace is talking about favor. God's unmerited favor. He gave it to us. He gave, he gave it to us freely. Favor. By grace you are saved. But grace is also used, thirdly, to talk about divine empowering. That means God's strength coming into our life. That is grace. Right? Example, uh, many examples. First Corinthians 15 10. First Corinthians 15 10. I am what I am by the grace of God. 
and the grace given to me was not in vain because I labored more abundantly than they all. So he's talking about working hard, but he's empowered by grace. First Corinthians 15, 10, or Second Corinthians 12. I think it's verse 7. Paul says, uh, God says to Paul, the Lord Jesus says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Second Corinthians 12, and I think it's verse 7. Let me give it to you. Um, sorry, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. So here grace is used to talk about strength, empowering. Did you all make a note of it? Yes? So in the New Testament, the word grace can be used in one of three different ways. It can talk about character. It could talk about favor. It could talk about strength, empowering. So depending on where it is used in the context, we have to interpret correctly. Don't say favor everywhere. Okay? No. Sometimes the word grace is used for something else. Right? So here in 2 Peter 3.18, he says, Grow in grace, in the grace, in the character, in the virtue of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow to be more and more like Him. Grace. And in the knowledge, in knowing Him. Knowing Him, who He is, what He can do. Grow in grace and knowledge. So our spirit has to keep growing. We have to keep growing in grace and in knowledge. All right? So ultimately, as we under, come to our, in, uh, learn about our identity in Christ, ultimately, our goal is to become like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to represent Jesus. In our lives. Okay, so as we learn about our identity and learn to walk in it, we will become more and more like Jesus. We can represent Him correctly. So we'll stop here for the break. We'll go for a break, and now after we come back from the break, we'll start section three. Any questions before we go? Any questions on what we did so far? Are you all following me? Yes. Questions? Yes, Daniel. Uh, we can send the mic there. Uh, First Corinthians 45, you said, sorry, which was? Let me go there. First Corinthians 15, verse 45. Okay. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Okay? Yeah, these two are the same or uh, is it different? First man, Adam, was made a living soul. Mm. And uh, is it after fall he is talking or uh, before fall? <laughs> so he's contrasting the life with Adam, first, first Adam and... Jesus, who is the last Adam. So in this case, he's talking about the natural life that comes through Adam. So uh, the first man, Adam, was made a living being, right? And he's referring to the natural life that comes through Adam, right? How do we know that? Because he's, he's talking about, you know, what, to, just if we look at the verses before, he's talking about, you know, uh, natural and Celestial, terrestrial. So there is the uh, celestial, heavenly bodies. There is the terrestrial. Uh, there is the natural, verse 44. There is the natural and there is a spiritual. Just the preceding verse, right? So that's what he's contrasting. There is the natural, there is a spiritual. So we receive natural life through Adam. He became a living being, a soul being. Of course, Adam was also a spiritual being, but the focus in this context is the natural life that we receive through Adam. But then, in contrast, the last Adam, that is Jesus, through him, he becomes a life-giving spirit. A quickening spirit means a life-giving spirit. That means we are receiving spiritual life through Jesus. Right? So in Adam, we receive natural life, but that is only natural. It will end, we'll die. But through Jesus, we receive 
spiritual life. We are born again, which we will never die. So the context is telling us he's contrasting these two, natural and spiritual. So that's what he's saying. But we can extend this idea to say other things, which is consistent with scripture. Like through Adam, sin. Through Jesus, righteousness. You know, Through Adam, judgment. Through Jesus, or condemnation. Through Jesus, there is justification. So that contrast, he, he, Paul does it in Romans 5. Right? So he contrasts. Through Adam, there was sin, there was disobedience, there was uh, judgment, condemnation. Through Jesus, there is, uh, because he was obedient, there is grace, there is justification. So he contrasts that also. But it's consistent with drawing that difference. Okay. All right, I heard the bell ring. Please enjoy a cup of tea and we will continue after break. Thank you.